Welcome to this week's meeting of the Velshi Band Book Club. Today, we are honoring the immeasurable James Baldwin. The oldest of nine children, Baldwin was raised in New York City by his mother and stepfather, who was a Baptist preacher from New Orleans. While attending DeWitt Clinton High School, Baldwin briefly became a preacher at Fireside Pentecostal Assembly, but ultimately he rejected religion. After graduating from high school, he moved to New York's Greenwich Village and split time writing and working odd jobs. Disillusioned and frustrated by the relentless racism and homophobia he experienced as a gay black man, Baldwin moved to Paris at the age of 24. Although he returned home frequently, it was in Europe that he would publish most of his work. Baldwin's plays, essays, novels, and the poems have received critical and cultural acclaim and continue to resonate today. There's so much to say about this remarkable man and his nation-defining canon of writing, but today we are examining The Fire Next Time. It is this collection of essays that cemented him as one of America's greatest thinkers and preeminent writers. The Fire Next Time is comprised of two essays, My Dungeon Shook, Letters to My Nephew on the 100th Anniversary of the Emancipation, and Down at the Cross, Letter from a Region of My Mind. Originally published in 1962 in The Progressive, a left-leaning American magazine founded in 1909, the first essay is a poignant letter to Baldwin's 15-year-old nephew. In barely 10 pages, Baldwin succinctly explores what we would now call, call structural racism and white privilege. Quote, you were born where you were born and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits to your ambition were thus expected to be settled. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity, end quote. The second essay, which takes up most of the book, addresses Baldwin's fractured relationship with his Harlem church and, the religion, and religion's effect on the black community. Originally published in The New Yorker, Down at the Cross culminates in a pointed admonition directed at white Americans, particularly liberal white Americans. Quote, the brutality with which Negroes are treated in this country simply cannot be overstated, however unwilling white men may be to hear it, end quote. Baldwin is equal parts writer and philosopher. In The Fire Next Time, he masterfully conveys his frustration with America and his deep longing for a better future and his belief that a better future can be had. Quote, but these men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers, and if the word integration means anything, this is what it means. That we shall love, sh that with love shall, we with love shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend, end quote. The fire next time forces white Americans to confront themselves and see their own implicit role in racism in America. It's a direct and honest look at this nation in 1962 and still today. Quote, therefore, whatever white people do not know about Negroes reveals precisely and inexorably what they do not know about themselves, end quote. The mirror Baldwin holds up to this country will not show a pretty reflection. That is the power of the fire next time. That is the power of James Baldwin. Joining me now is a longstanding member of the Velshi Band Book Club, Eddie Glaude Jr. He's a professor and chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, an MSNBC contributor, author of the award-winning book about James Baldwin, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. In fact, you were the guy with whom I conceptualized Such a the, the Band yeah. Book Club uh, two years ago. So thank you for your constant support of this. And I, I want to talk about James Baldwin's book by talking about your book. Because in uh, Begin Again, you mention the fire next time, and you write, quote, When I read the fire next time, I could, when I read the fire next time, I could not reconcile his rage with his talk of love. It was like Dr. King meets Henry James meets Malcolm X meets Freud. Baldwin was too personal. Yeah, he, he forced me to kind of encounter my own anger. Yeah. I grew up in Mississippi. I grew up with a whole host of assumptions about who I was, mm -hmm. what I was capable of. And then in the midst of that rage, 
the invocation of love, right? A kind of maturity, a kind of uh, reaching out or going towards that reminded me of my great grandmother, right? Because that hatred would eat you up. Yes. And Baldwin had to learn that. Yes. Otherwise, he would become his stepfather. Right, because he had the history. He he has the uh, ancestral and historical rage that can be held in black people, and then he had new things to which he was subject uh, in his family and being a gay black man. Oh, absolutely. He was there was a lot of rage, and he was trying to figure out how this becomes productive. Some of his messages were to black people, including uh, the letter to his nephew. But a lot of his messages were for white liberals. Yeah, you know, folks who are debased are affected, but those who do the debasing are also dehumanized, right? And so Baldwin would say, I'm, I've never been the problem. I've never been the N-word. The question is, why do you need the N-word in the first place? Right. Why do you need the illegal? Why do you need the terrorist? Why do you need the abomination? Why do you need the Jew? Right. right? Baldwin was consistent that this is, has something to do with the gaping hole in the soul of those who require these scapegoats, who require these others, as it were. Yeah. This has become, as you've written, uh, as relevant. In Begin Again, you talk about lessons for today. Right. And in the introduction, I talked about the fact that this book was very relevant in 1962, and yet the messages resonate today. What's different about the message in, in James Baldwin's work in 1962 and the message that people need to hear about racism and prejudice and homophobia uh, and, and, and today? You know, the difference is that we went through the mid-20th century. There's this idea that we've addressed it already. Right, because right after 1962, we actually did go through something right. that felt like a reckoning. Right, well, remember, at the end of Fire Next Time, Baldwin says, no, God gave no other rainbow sign next to the fire next time, right? Harlem explodes the next year, 64. Yep. Yep. Remember, 62, when he's writing the essays, that's the Battle of Oxford. 63, Medgar Evers is, is murdered, yep. right? And so Birmingham is in 63. He sees those hoses, right? So what we have that Baldwin didn't have, we have him. Mm. We have Jimmy. And then we have this moment, the arrogance that comes with that journey, that somehow we've resolved it. Right. When in fact, what Baldwin was asking us to do in 63 was to grow up. Yep. And we're still adolescents when it comes yep. to this question of race, Alan. We just don't want to believe that we can imagine ourselves being together differently. That somehow the idea of whiteness means that you ought to be valued more than others. And we have yet to let that go, it seems to me. Uh, I want to read a moment from The Fire Next Time that sure. has stayed with me. White Americans do not believe in death, and this is why the darkness of my skin so intimidates them. But renewal becomes impossible if one supposes things to be constant that are not. Safety, for example, mm -hmm. or money, or power. One clings to the chimeras by which one can only be betrayed, an entire, and the entire hope, the entire possibility of freedom disappears. What is this idea that he was trying to get across, that white Americans don't believe in death? Yeah, we're a death-dodging civilization, right? We're always future-oriented, future prospective. This is a nation that was born not with feudal titles, not, with t not tethered to some long past that described your future and my future. No, it's open-ended. So, you know, death is a secession of possibility. America is unbounded possibility. At least that's the mythos. And so when you encounter these folk, these dark folk, these blues people, somehow that reality, that illusion, right, runs up against the reality of, right, these actual human beings. And so when you are death dodging, you find yourself slipping into idols, whether it be money, whether it be race, whether it be greed, whether it be material things, trying to avoid, you know, that ultimate fact of what it means to be a human being. Baldwin says one must face death, you know, and in order to face death, one must face the conundrum of life, right? In order to face death, you must face with passion right. the conundrum of life. So you have to accept the reality of your day-to-day of your -day circumstances. So if one of my viewers, who might be white and liberal, right. wishes to give this book to someone else who might be white and liberal, then they say, why would I read this today? Well, you know, it sounds cliche. We just got to become better human beings if we want a better world. We have to, in order to become better human beings, Ali, we have to confront the ugliness of the world, which means we have to confront the ugliness in us. The white liberal always wants to feel good, virtue signal. Baldwin says, I'm skeptical of people who want to do something for me, as opposed to some people who want to do something with me. We're not a, 
Racial justice is not a philanthropic enterprise. Mm. It's not a charitable gesture, right? If we want to be better people, we got to look ourselves in the mirror. Thank you, my friend, for everything. Thank you for your great analysis. Thank you for helping us launch the Velshi Band Book Club. Thank you for making us smarter about James Baldwin and your book and for this. Thank you, Doc. All right. Eddie Glaude, Jr. is the professor and chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University. He's an MSNBC contributor, and he is the author of the important book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America, and its urgent lessons for our own.